The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Strauss here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with another wheat school and we are at the end of the wheat school season. It has been a great season, Jeremy, and we are just wrapping up again. But I have here with me Jeremy Boychin, who is an agronomy research extension specialist with Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions. How is it going today? It's doing, it's, it's going great, Kara. I feel like, you know, we've, we've come to the end of, of uh, this wheat school season, but I feel like I haven't seen you as much as last year and it kind of makes me a little sad. No, oh, I know. It's, uh, it's been a different, uh, different year for sure. And I think uh, everyone's, it's, it's tough not going to be able to do some of the things we like to do in the winter, but uh, I think it's nice we have things like Skype and Zoom that we can see each other and uh, keep content rolling out to all all our listeners. So we are here today to talk about wheat seed fungal disease testing. Now, if you're a producer that has never done this before, why would why would you want to consider putting this into your winter plan? Uh, testing your wheat seed for for fungal disease is important um, for a few reasons. You know, if, if you if you just get a test that's going to give you um, germination and vigor, uh, and your your germination is down, it's not going to really give you a good idea of maybe why that germination is down. Um, and you, you may be increasing your seeding rates based on that low germination, um, but you may be able to address that problem better if you if you have an idea of what diseases are in that seed. So it just helps producers better manage that seed or make. Um, uh, more appropriate decisions around how to manage, whether either through seed treatment or choosing a different seed lot, um, based on the results that come back from that uh, fungal testing. So, how do producers go about uh, collecting seed to be tested? Can you talk a bit about that process? So, they would be collecting it uh, the same way that they would be looking to collect it to send it into a grain elevator or to the uh, grain sample program with CGC. Um, they want to make sure that they're collecting uh, um, uh, a distributed sample of their grain. That way they're getting a good idea of what the entire grain lot looks like. Um, and then they're going to be submitting it to whatever um, seed testing lab that they that they want. There's a few different options in Western Canada. Um, so pick one that, that you like to work with and send it into them and, and they'll send you um, their results right back. So when you get these results back, there can be long lists of things you're seeing. Can you talk a bit about certain levels of infections that actually warrant addressing? Yeah, um, I mean, this is something that comes up every year. There's a variety of different results that pop up um, when you're doing a fungi test. Um, Aspergillus is on there, penicillin is on there, um, alternaria is on there, cladosporium, um, epicoccum, cochleobus, all of these things are on there. And the question is, is, okay, at what number do I need to actually address these or, or which of these is actually impacting my germination? Um, because that's the question we want to ask. Because when we're, when we're looking at these, if our germination rates are low, we want to make sure we're looking at these properly and saying, okay, I'm addressing these so I can get my germination right, um, so I can put the correct amount of seed in the ground. Um, so knowing which of these uh, funguses are actually affecting germination is going to be important. Um, and in general, you can lump all of these into three different categories. You have your weak uh, pathogens, you have your storage pathogens, and then you have your pathogenic pathogens. So your storage pathogens um, are going to be aspergillus and penicillin. Um, and in general, these do not cause an impact to your germination. Um, what these are is they're a storage mold. If if your seed goes into the bin when it's wet and warm, um, and, and there's already some of that, uh, those fungi in there, um, it'll continue to grow. And then you'll actually start to see bin burnt seed. So if you get these numbers back and they're somewhere between 10 to 15% and your germination is a little bit lower than you think it, it should be, um, then potentially this is causing an issue. And actually there is some seed treatment uh, that can be used to mitigate some of that. Um, the other group that you can see uh, is your is your weak pathogens, uh, and that's going to be Alternaria, Cladosporum, and, and Epicoccum. And these are actually, if you drive around in the fall um, and you see crop that's been um, uh, swathed, 
uh, or it's really late to be harvested, you see it start to go from that golden brown to that dark um, kind of uh, like really brownish, darkish brown color. Mm-hmm. Um, that's those diseases taking over the plant tissue. So it's it, what they're called are saprophytes, and they only really attack dead tissue. Um, so when it comes to germinating seed, Typically, they are not going to cause any concern. I mean, you can get cumulative um, infection levels of these three up to 50% without really causing any issues. If you have it above 50% and you're seeing some germination issues as well, um, then potentially there's some concern there. But most likely, even if those numbers are high, you're not going to see too many issues um, in terms of germination. But if you do, it's probably a good idea to call the seed lab and see what they think. And then the last ones that are on there um, are Cochleobus, Fusarium, Fusarium graminearum, um, Pyronophora, and the last one I always screw up, uh, Paranist- Parastagnosporum. Uh, Parastagnospora. Um, these uh, five remaining ones are your pathogenic fungi, and these are the ones that typically cause the most impact to, to germination. Um, so Fusarium graminearum is, is kind of a whole different monster, and the way you manage that is going to be highly dependent on where you are in the province or where, you're, where you are in Western Canada. So I don't want to touch on that yet. If you want more information and you're in Alberta, head to managefhb.ca, and there's a ton of information there. But for the other ones on there, if you're finding Finding levels between 10 to 15 percent infection, either individually or cumulatively, and you're seeing a germination decrease, um, then it's probably a good idea to either find a broad spectrum fungicide um, seed treatment uh, or something that's targeted at the um, potential individual um, uh, fungi that may be impacting germination. But you really want to look at your germination first and say, um, is this germination level where I expect it to be? And then you kind of move through those disease groups, those fungi groups, um, and see where there's potential issues rising from. So if you're a producer that, like I said earlier, if you've never done this before, you might go, ah, you know, I've skipped it previous years. It seems like a lot of work. Um, Can you just comment on the importance of of this and why it might impact the success of your crop going forward? Yeah, like I like I said, when it comes to um, seed tests, and, and maybe you don't even get a, a germination test, um, and you you know you just put two two bushels in the ground and and it grows. Um, but you know all of these um, varieties of of wheats, they all um, hit peak potential when you get the ideal seeding rate. Um, when you're in that, uh, you know, 28 to 30 plants per square foot, depending on your region, if it's a little bit drier, it might be a little bit lower. If you're a little bit wetter, it might be a little bit higher. Um, so I'll just throw that <laughs> asterisk on there. Um, so knowing what you're working with, with your seed is going to be so important to make sure that you're putting the right amount of seed in the ground and you're protecting that seed um, from lack of germination that might happen if that disease does take over. The other thing you need to think about that even if some of these diseases aren't impacting your germination, um, some of them can be the precursor for foliar disease. Um, So cochleobus uh, is actually um, the precursor for spot blotch in barley. Um, Pyronophora is actually uh, leaf stripe in barley. And then (laughs) paragnostorus Spora, uh, Pregnospora sporum uh, is actually leaf blotch. It's probably, I probably did a terrible job on that <laughs> in wheat. So even if it doesn't impact your germination, um, it has the potential to move through the plant and then become a foliar disease. And then when it becomes a foliar disease, then it impacts and infects the residue. And then that residue builds up in your soils and impacts future um, crops that you're growing. So it's, it's just an important um, thing for one, for germination to make sure you're getting the right stand and two, uh, to make sure that you're protecting that crop from foliar issues as well as future crops. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I I just want to say that this is, uh, you know, seed testing and seed treatment is just one part of the package to make sure that you're doing uh, proper disease control. You want to make sure that you have a good, strong rotation that comes ar- along with that. You want to make sure that if you're picking varieties, you're picking varieties that are suited to the diseases that you see most often. So you're mitigating the buildup of that. Um, and, you know, you're doing a, a proper nutrient management program to make sure that you're you're having healthy plants um, that are less susceptible to disease. You're scouting, you're spraying when you need to. So it's not something that should be relied on wholly, um, but it is part 
of a stronger, larger program. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And we will talk to you next year. Thanks, Dara. <laughs>